Well, welcome to our 16th episode of Paradise Has Two Trees. This has been quite an experience. We actually began this series uh, in last September 2019 and had planned on finishing it, of course, by uh, the end of May. As it turns out, we've, uh, with the schedule for Pascha, and then the pandemic of COVID-19. Here we are on the last Monday of August, attempting to record and present then our last and final episode of Paradise Has Two Trees. So it's been a year in the making. Uh, we never dreamed it would be this way, but it is. Those of you that are watching, of course, the, semina uh, the seminars on the internet or YouTube or on the church website or Prime, Prime Video, uh, you've got all of them there, so it, it doesn't show up with you. It just feels awkward for us here to be coming back with having not taped the last one for so many, so many months. I do want to let you know that because it's taken this much time that the book Paradise Has Two Trees that contains the, the text of all of these seminars is now available uh, on Amazon.com. So if you've not already had a chance to bump into it and you would be so interested, uh, it's available there. And uh, Richard's back there recording these, Richard Yeager, like always. And Richard, if you can leave it in place for just one second, take your headphones off, and come up here, I'd like to give this copy to you to say thank you for coming and doing all of these recordings. I know. I really want to say thank you to you. And God bless you for doing this. There you go. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Thank you. So we come now to our final chapter together. Paradise has two trees. So practically speaking, we have lived as captives in the world of judgment. Our entire life has been lived based upon having eaten from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Our entire lives have been lived based upon rules, regulations, laws, and restrictions. You see, old habits die hard. As immigrants now to paradise, we bring the habits of the old country with us. So how then do we break the habit of thinking and being judgmental? Well, you see, first of all, we are no longer who we used to be we must realize that we are no longer who we used to be. For if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. We are not the old person in a new setting. We haven't just changed location. That's only a change of geography. Christ did not come to make bad men good. He came to make dead men alive. Inside the world of judgment, the problem is always forensic. It's ethical, moral, legal. Somebody broke a rule. The issue is always disobedience, the breaking of rules. But the issue of life is not disobedience. It is not ethical, but ontological. Christ's incarnation has as its goal the ontological rebirth of mankind from within, not the ethical improvement of man from without. We are created to become like the image of God within us, to behave like God. 
There is a huge difference in behaving the way God behaves and simply obeying a rule. Their return to paradise from the captivity of the tree of judgment requires an ontological rebirth by which mankind is renewed according to the image the word of God came in his own person because it was he alone who is the image of the Father who would recreate man made after that image. He, the image of the Father, came and dwelt in our midst in order that he might renew mankind made after himself. This is what Jesus meant when he told Nicodemus that unless one was begotten from above, he could not see paradise. And if one was not begotten of the water and the spirit, he could not enter paradise. You see, our purpose is to become like the image, not to obey a new set of rules. Well, it's the likeness versus law, life versus death, isn't it? By the way, I remind you again that all of the footnotes are available in the printed book available, uh, and I don't take time during our seminars together to always identify which of the church fathers or authors I may be citing. The tree of likeness is the tree of life. Let me say it again. The tree of likeness is the tree of life. The tree of law is the tree of death. Likeness gives life. Law gives death. There is a radical separation between likeness and law, between life and death. Those in the world of death die in death. Those in the world of life live in life. Those in the world of life live according to the image of God. Those in the world of death die obeying the rules. St. Paul told the Corinthians that the strength of sin is the law. Our sin is choosing to live by law instead of by living by likeness. The choice between the tree of life and the tree of death is the choice between likeness and law. Our sin is rejecting the purpose for which we are created in the first place, to make visible in our behavior the invisible behavior of our Creator. We choose instead to create man-made rules and judge behavior according to our rules. Sin thereby becomes simply the breaking of our man-made rules. Without rules, there is no sin because there are no rules to break. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. For where there is no law, there is no transgression. And sin is not imputed when there is no law, citing passages from the book of Romans. We who were once captives in the world of law, the world of judgmentalism, the world of death have been delivered from our captivity. For Christ is the end of the law. Christ is our deliverance from the world of law, our deliverance from judging one another according to the rules. For freedom Christ has set us free Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. 
Christ has set us free from the world of rules. We are now free to live according to the image of God within us. We must stand firm and not return to captivity. You see, once and for all, this is the point. We have been set free from the world of judgment and judgmentalism. Why are we therefore not living according to the image within us? Why are we still, as Christians who have been set free, still living according to rules? Why are we still judging and devouring one another? St. Paul's confrontation with St. Peter in Galatia was over this precise point. Judaism separated its Mosaic law from all the various law systems of the Gentiles. The Jews considered their holy law to be categorically better, categorically different from all other legal systems. Now, not all Jews were righteous, kept the law, but those who attempted to keep and live by the dietary and other laws were considered righteous, considered alive with God, considered that they had been made righteous by accepting and attempting to live according to those rules. All non-Jewish legal systems were deemed godless systems, and all Gentiles, as well as all non-practicing Jews, were considered sinners. Now, the first Christians, of course, were not only Jews, they were practicing Jews. And so it was easy for Peter and other Christian Jews to think of Christ in Jewish terms inside Judaism as an in-house tug of war inside Judaism between Christian grace versus Mosaic law, law versus grace inside of Judaism. St. Paul, on the other hand, understood that it was the law itself, whether a Gentile legal system or a Mosaic re religious system, it was the law itself that was in conflict with life in the spirit. There is living in the world of law, whether Jewish law or Gentile law or Christian law, but there is also living in the world of life, whether living in the world of life is done by Jews or Gentiles. The, the difference is between a legal system, wherever it comes from, versus the world of the spirit in life. Because of Augustine and Luther's Sola Scriptura, the letters of Paul are read as a fight inside Judaism between Mosaic law versus Christian grace, rather than seen as a showdown between the world of life versus the world of death. The world of life versus the world of law. It is against the backdrop of the world of life versus the world of law that Paul's letters to the Galatian is written, in which he explains his trip to Jerusalem, in which he went up by revelation and communicated to them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. But privately to those who were of reputation, lest by any means 
I might run or had run in vain. Now, geographically, went up, when Paul says, I went up to Jerusalem by revelation, refers to going up to Jerusalem, which is situated in the mountains. One always went up to Jerusalem and came down from Jerusalem. However, mystagogically speaking, went up means to ascend. Paul says, I ascended by revelation. The term apocalypse, translated revelation, as a verb or a noun, something was revealed, or that which was revealed, the revelation, as a verb or noun is found 40 times in the New Testament, 34 times by St. Paul. The gospel of the world of life versus the world of law that Paul preached was not invented by Paul. I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man, for I neither received it from man nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. It is this gospel, the gospel of the world of life versus the world of law, the gospel revealed to Paul as he ascended into the revelation of Jesus Christ that Paul explained to those in Jerusalem to have this gospel verified, lest by any means he might have run or had run in vain. It was this gospel, the gospel of the world of life versus the world of law, that is the gospel. Any other so-called gospel is a heterodox gospel, a different gospel, a gospel created by those who want to pervert the gospel of Christ. Therefore, let us hear the following passage from Paul about the perspective of the world of life versus the world of law. Paul's use of the term law is therefore generic of all legal systems and is not limited or restricted to only Jewish mosaic law. In this passage, I will, I'm about to quote, the Jewish Christians refused to associate with the Gentile Christians. In contemporary terms, the ethnic Christians refused to associate with the convert Christians, thus giving the appearance the gospel was for those original ones, those practicing the law, or those born into the system. Notice how Paul responds in that situation in terms of life versus law. It's found in Galatians. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, if you being a Jew live in the manner of Gentiles, that is, live free from the law, and not as a Jew, keeping law, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews, live under the law, when other people show up? We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, like the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified, not made alive by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we Jews with the law have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be made alive 
by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified, made alive. Paul then addressed the issue of trying to mix gospel and law into a hybrid, heterodox kind of gospel. He says then in Galatians, But if, while we seek to be made alive by Christ, we ourselves are found sinners, still trying and failing to keep the law, is Christ therefore a minister of sin? That is, is it, is it Christ's fault that we fail to keep the law and are therefore still failures, sinners? Well, certainly not. What are we doing trying to still keep the law in the first place? It is not God's fault that we refuse to live in paradise. We who have been begotten from above and now approach the tree of life within God's paradise and receive the immaculate body and precious blood have chosen to return to captivity. Being set free, we now seek to live under the law. Having life, we seek death instead. It is not Christ's fault, but our own fault for still living in the world of law. Wow. Again in Galatians. For if I build again those things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. Let us once and for all decide the issue for ourselves. Are we under the law or set free from law? Does the law give us life or does God give us life? It is either or. We cannot have it both ways. We choose the tree of life and we base our whole life on the tree of life. Or we choose the tree of law and death and base our whole life on rules and judgments. Continuing in Galatians. For I through the law died to the law that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me and the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I'm not living it by law. This is the confession of those who have chosen the tree of life and who now live in paradise. I have died to the world of the law, died to its death and judgmentalism. I now live a different kind of life, a life empowered by the Christ who lives in me, empowered by the icon of God within me and the life which I now live in this flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. I now live according to the icon of God within me, becoming like the icon of God. The distinction between the tree of life and the tree of law is absolute. Again in Galatians, I do not set aside the grace of God. For if life, righteousness, comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. 
So let us settle this once and for all. Paul says to the Galatians, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? This only I want to learn from you. Tell me this. Did you receive the Spirit by keeping the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit? Are you now being completed by the flesh, by the law? Therefore, he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the rules of the law, the works of the law, the keeping of the law, or by the hearing of faith? Well, you see, we are in need of rehabilitation in order to break our old habits. Having lived our entire life as captives in the judgmentalism of the law, now that we have been crucified with Christ and it is no longer we who live, but Christ who lives in me and lives in us and the life which we now live, we live in the flesh by becoming like the icon of the Son of God in us, the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. How do we break the habits of the old way of living? How do we break the habit of judgmentalism? You see, human salvation is understood and lived as a participation. A participation today in the original paradise of God. Salvation is a participation now rather than a passive anticipation of the world to come. Our participation in paradise requires rehabilitation, requires a process of being rehabilitated. The fall has, as it were, injured us and hindered our ability to walk in paradise. Rehabilitation is necessary for us to learn how to live and walk again in paradise. Old habits are difficult to break, but they are breakable. A habit is a learned response to a stimulus. A habit is a learned response to a stimulus. A stimulus occurs and we automatically respond, automatically give a particular response. We have done it for so long that our response is automatic predictable, the automatic knee-jerk. Judgmentalism is a learned response from living in the world of law. You see, in the world of law, everyone creates their own rules of personal preferences by which they evaluate and judge others. I'm not speaking of the personal preference of how you like your eggs cooked or how you like uh, your meat cooked. I'm talking about how we look at other people. Any deviation from our self-created value systems triggers an immediate response. The alarm goes off inside us Someone broke the rule, they are judged guilty, and therefore dismissed as inferior, a sinner, or they don't know any better. Uh, I can't believe he dressed like that. Just a personal preference value 
judgment. So how do we break the habit? We break the old habit of judgmentalism with forgiveness. As seriously as we must understand that the world we now live in is paradise and that that world is not the world that the world out there lives in. As seriously as we must understand that the world of life is absolutely contradictory to the world of law, in that same way, we must cancel judgment with forgiveness. The world of life is absolutely different to the world of law. The world of judgmentalism can only be broken with forgiveness. Matthew 6, 12, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Matthew 6, 14, for if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Matthew 6, 15, but if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Mark eleven twenty five, And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him that your heaven, Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. Mark eleven twenty six. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. Matthew 18, 21. Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven? And Jesus said to him, I do not say up to seven, but up to 70 times seven. Matthew 18, 23. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king. And I'll just summarize it who wanted to settle accounts with all of those that owed him money. And he comes to one of his servants that owes him $10,000 million. And the guy says, I cannot repay you. Have mercy and forgive my debt. And the great king in his mercy forgives this man this humongous debt. And then it is brought to the king's attention that this very same forgiven man also went to some of his buddies that owed him some money, one of whom owed him 10 bucks. And he went and demanded that the guy pay him back. And when the man begged for mercy, this forgiven man said, Ha! I'm going to throw you in jail until you get me my money. And when the king heard what this man, whom he had forgiven, how he treated his person that owed him something. He took that servant and threw him into jail instead. It is the same story, isn't it? So when we who have been forgiven do not in turn forgive others, Christ says, so my heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you from your heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. Matthew 7, 1, judge not that you not be judged, for with whatever judgment 
you judge others, you will be judged as well. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Luke 6, 37, judge not and you'll not be judged. Condemn not and you shall not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure you use, it'll be measured back to you. The same yardstick you use judging behavior will be used by God against us judging our behavior. Matthew 7, 3, And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye? Do not consider the plank in your own eye. Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck that is in your eye and have a plank in your own eye? Hypocrite! Remove the plank from your own eye and then you will see clearly to help remove the speck from your brother's eye. Jesus said, Luke 23, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. He said it while hanging on the cross. Ephesians 4, 32, And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ forgave you. Colossians 3, 12, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, putting up with one another, forgiving one another. And if anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. Luke 10, 38. It happened as they went into a certain village and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving and she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to get up and help me. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part, and it'll not be taken from her. St. Macarius in homily. Thus he who prays should not judge the one working because he is not praying. Ha! Huh. Why aren't you at church on Sunday? Neither should he who works condemn the one praying because he is resting while he himself is doing all the work. Neither should he who is serving Condemn another, but let each one do whatever he is doing to the glory of God. Let us not worry why somebody else is doing what they're doing or not doing what we're doing. Rather, let each one of us give glory to God for whatever it is we are doing. You see, we overcome judging with forgiving. We must practice forgiving. Every time someone breaks one of our rules, our preferences, before we can judge them guilty, we must respond with, I forgive you for that. As soon as we become aware that we have judged someone, let us forgive them 
for having broken one of our preferences, one of our rules. We've all heard the expression, my house, my rules. Likewise, this is true, my rules, my forgiveness. We have created the rule by which we judge others. It is our rule. We also have the power to forgive anyone for breaking one of our rules. God has given the power to forgive to mankind. We judge and criticize others for breaking one of the rules we made. It is our rule they broke. It is our forgiveness we give for breaking our rule. Let me give you a personal story, if you will, a personal confession. In 1971, as a young seminarian, I was a youth director at a large church in Raleigh, North Carolina. Now, the church had been founded in 1832 by tobacco farmers who worshiped there with their families and their slaves. After the Civil War, the former slaves formed their own church down the road about a mile away. 139 years later, both churches were now surrounded by the suburbs of Raleigh. Now, in 1971, our nation was being torn apart by protests over the Vietnam War and racial tensions. A year earlier, the students at Kent State University had been massacred by the Ohio National Guard. Dr. Martin Luther King and Bobby Kennedy had been assassinated only three years previously. In Raleigh, North Carolina in 1971, only whites could enter a hospital by the front door. All people of color could only enter by the back entrance. In 1971, the most segregated hour in America was 11 a.m. on Sunday morning. The headlines were filled with stories of non-whites showing up at white churches and creating a confrontation that made the evening news. Now, I did not normally attend the church board meetings, but I had been invited to be there for this meeting. The issue was whether any non-white person who showed up would be allowed to worship with us. The polite conversation soon turned heated. At some point, the man sitting across from me, old enough to have been my grandfather, said in the strongest segregationist terms, it'll be over my dead body before any of those troublemaking blankety blanks set one foot inside this church. Righteous indignation boiled up inside of me. I hurled my arm across the table, pointed at him, and yelled out, I forgive you for that. And he yelled back, I didn't ask you to forgive me. And I yelled, I forgive you anyway. Needless to say, I was never invited back to another board meeting. That moment was never spoken of again by anyone to me. The man and I were cordial and civil when we saw each other at church. You see, somehow forgiveness had been spoken and was experienced without ever being spoken again. Three years later, he had become one of my strongest supporters. When I resigned, he expressed the warmest regrets that I was leaving. You see, forgiveness is real and it is powerful. There is healing at the literal surface level 
of speaking forgiveness. We must not minimize that. The power of forgiveness is real. But let us not be content with the surface only. Let us see what lies beneath the surface of forgiveness. What is invisibly present, after all, in forgiveness? You see, forgiveness always implies judgment. Something we do not like has occurred. Someone has offended us, hurt us, injured us, broken the rules, has somehow misbehaved. We have judged them guilty of something. I forgave that man that night. In my righteous indignation, I judged him guilty of being a bigoted racist. I did not see my own arrogant, self-righteous attitude. I judged him guilty. I judged myself morally superior. 48 years ago this summer, I read a homily from 1600 years ago on the words of Jesus, forgive and it will be forgiven you. Saint Macario said, paraphrasing, let us not accuse the guilty one. Let us be thankful and love the guilty one who gives us the opportunity that God will forgive us the same way we now forgive this guilty person. Those who hurt us or offend us are our benefactors, since we receive from them the occasion of our own forgiveness. They're doing us a favor. We cannot save ourselves. There is no other way to be saved except through the neighbor, especially the neighbor who offends us. The sins, the faults, the mistakes of those around us give us the opportunity of forgiveness for ourselves. It is by being grateful for the one who offends us, being grateful for their giving us the opportunity to forgive them, through being grateful we gain entrance into the deepest mysteries of forgiveness. In the joy of being forgiven ourselves, in our gratitude to the one who offended us and the forgiveness we have now received in having forgiven them, we now do good to that person who offends us. Wow. You see, the person who just offended me, if I catch it, and I'm able to give forgiveness, God just forgave me in the first place for judging them. They just did me a favor. We pray it every time we say the Lord's Prayer and forgive me my trespasses exactly the same way I forgive others theirs. This one who just offended me helped God answer that prayer in my behalf when I forgave them. And so now I am grateful to the one who offended me because now I have received forgiveness from God for myself. As I remembered that episode 48 years ago when I read this homily, 
I realized that 48 years ago, I judged a man for thinking he was racially superior. I now realize when I forgave him for thinking he was racially superior, God forgave me for thinking I was morally superior to him. It has taken me 48 years to be grateful for the opportunity that man gave me to be forgiven for thinking I was better than he. We cannot save ourselves. There is no other way to be saved except through our neighbor. As Christ commanded us, forgive and it will be forgiven you. It has taken me 48 years to thank God for that man. Because of that man, I have been forgiven the arrogance of thinking I was better than he. It has taken me 48 years to realize we both were guilty of thinking we were better than someone else. Well, you know, that's probably a nice little stopping point. I realize those who watch these on uh, video can stop and catch their breath and rethink, replay. But for those of us doing it live, it's nice to be able to take a break, uh, get a cup of coffee, uh, stand up, stretch our legs before we start again. So we're going to take locally here just a brief break. And we'll start the last part of our conclusion of episode 16 in just a moment. We'll be right back. Thanks. Well, welcome back from our little break. Let us see if we can try to summarize our 16 weeks together and where we are. Paradise still has its two trees. We began by saying paradise has two trees. 16 weeks later, paradise still has two trees. When we eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the judgmental tree of death, we live only then in the visible world of death. You see, the visible world of death, it only has one tree. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the tree, the judgmental tree of death. Our deliverance from the world of death returns us to paradise, the world of life in which the visible and the invisible exist simultaneously interpenetrated. Paradise is still paradise. It had two special trees then. It has those two special trees now. We know what happens when we eat from the tree of judgmental death. But what happens to the tree of death when we eat from the tree of life? To ask that question differently, what is the role of law and judgment in the world of life? The presence of the tree of death in paradise creates the opportunity for a struggle for us. Iron sharpens iron, and so one man sharpens another, the book of Proverbs says. You see, butter dulls a knife. Iron sharpens it. 
It is the struggles of life that bring strength to us. Struggles are not, in and of themselves, necessarily a bad thing. We are in the midst of a pandemic. Our lives have been altered. We now wear masks when we are around others. It has altered our lives, but we have discovered something about it once we got tired of our complaining about it. We have discovered things about our family lives that we had lost. Families taking walks together, talking together, watching even the same show on TV together. We have rediscovered that we hadn't been as close to God as we wanted. We are having people that have never been to an Orthodox church who are watching these videos as they're out there contacting us because during the COVID-19 They've got time on their hands. And when the threat of death hangs in the air, sometimes people decide they ought to get serious about the question of life. Locally, we have many people almost weekly calling the church, saying, I'm not Orthodox, but could I come to a service? So not every struggle is in and of itself a bad thing. Dying from this, I don't mean to minimize the danger at all. But things can happen that are good for us even in the midst of that struggle. The presence of the tree of judgmental death inside paradise, inside the world we are now living in, having been begotten from above in, provides us the possibility and the opportunity within ourselves for struggle. There are other English translations of this verse that iron sharpens iron, so that one man sharpens the countenance of his friend. This verse out of Proverbs in the Septuagint, in the Greek, uses the term prosopon, which we encountered all the way back, I think, in episode six, or at least when we discussed chapter six, as we discuss the creation of Adam. Prosopon means face to face. It is a special term in Greek meaning person. Even as the term husband, wife, is a relative pair, with each term husband, wife, being defined by the relationship with the other. You can't say husband without implying wife, and you can't say wife without implying husband. You cannot separate the two terms. Likewise, prosopon has a, a, a companion term in the Greek. Prosopon, prosopon, person, person, or person and the other, looking at each other face to face. So Proverbs 27, 17 in the Septuagint reads, as iron sharpens iron, so one man personalizes the other. That is, one man personalizes the other. He is face 
to face with. We personalize the other, whoever the other is that's face to face with us. Even those we judge guilty of not knowing the difference between good and evil, not knowing our rules. Obviously, if they had known our rules, they'd have kept them. We nonetheless can love them because they are cooperating with us in our own goal of becoming like God. The holy of prophets, apostles, and martyrs neither turned away those who were good nor accused the evil ones since they regarded all as ambassadors of the master's providential order. Everyone was an ambassador being used by God to enter our lives to give us an opportunity to benefit. Therefore, towards all they had, a sympathetic attitude. When they heard the Lord saying, forgive, and it will be forgiven you, since they received from those around them, good or evil, the occasion for their own forgiveness. We who are not complete will have our sins forgiven to the extent we forgive others for having broken our rules. Because of the other tree, the tree of judgmental death, in the forgiving of those who break our rules, we will receive forgiveness from God for having refused to become like His image within us for having refused to see that person the way God sees them. There is no other way to be saved except through the neighbor, as he commanded, forgive, and it will be forgiven you. For Christ says, I did not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. How is it to be fulfilled? By seizing the occasion to bless the one who sinned, who broke the rule, who condemned his injustice. This is what it says in Deuteronomy 17, 8. In the midst of judgment, judgment and in the midst of forgiveness, forgiveness. The fullness, therefore, of the law consists in forgiveness. Forgiveness is given to the one forgiving. The tree of judgment that once empowered our death now is turned by God's grace into the means of our forgiveness. The tree that taught us to judge and criticize now unknowingly offers the occasion for us to forgive and in return be forgiven ourselves. Forgive me my trespasses as I Forgive them. Every time we become aware we are exercising judgment becomes an occasion, an opportunity to forgive immediately the one for the offense by which we judge them guilty. 
In the words of Christ, I forgive him, for he knows not what he does. I forgive him, for he doesn't know he's breaking one of my rules. You don't wear white after Labor Day. <laughs> In the act of forgiving, we are ourselves forgiven for creating the rule and for judging others in the first place. Little by little, one act of forgiveness at a time, the habit of judgmentalism begins to be replaced with the habit of forgiveness until forgiveness fulfills the law. It so fills our judgmentalism that our judgmentalism ceases to be at work in us. Behold, old things have passed away. All things have become new. You see, the day comes when we no longer judge people by categories, seeing them as this or that, we ought not to pass judgment of any kind on anyone, neither the prostitute or on sinners or disorderly persons. We should look upon all persons with a single mind and a pure eye, so that it may become for us almost a natural and fixed attitude never to despise or judge or abhor anyone or to divide people according to categories. If you see a man with one eye, do not make any judgment in your heart, but regard him as if he were whole. If someone has a maimed hand, see him not as maimed, see the crippled as straight, the paralytic as healthy. Instead of judging and labeling people into categories, let us see not an individual to be judged, but a whole person. When four men let their paralyzed friend down through a hole in the roof, Jesus asked, which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, arise, take up your bed and walk. You see, our sin is we see a label, a category, a problem to be fixed. We see a paralytic. Jesus instead sees a whole person that needs loved. He sees a whole person that needs restored to wholeness. That we too then might learn to see who the man had been all along. In other words, Forgiveness and wholeness go together. It is forgiveness that heals the judgmental division of people into categories. The habit of judgmentalism is overcome one act of forgiveness at a time. We are healed of our judgmentalism by forgiving others of being less than perfect when we judge by our judgmental standards. One act of forgiveness at a time, we begin seeing whole persons instead of flawed individuals. One act of forgiveness at a time on our part, God heals our 
blindness and lets us see a whole person instead of an individual to be judged. You see, forgiveness fulfills the law. The fullness, therefore, of the law consists of forgiveness. Forgiveness is given to the one forgiving. Mankind has never, was never created to eat of and build his life, our life, on the second tree, the tree of judgment and death. The serpent deceived Adam and Eve and sold mankind death disguised as life. But what the serpent intended for evil, God now uses for good to save and give life to those living in the judgmental world of death. Jesus healed the paralytic by forgiving him. The point in Mark's account is, but that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go home. However, it was not forgiveness, but the healing that the people noticed in the Gospel of Mark. And immediately he arose, took up the bed, went out in the presence of them all, so that all were amazed and glorified, saying, We never saw anything like this. On the other hand, Matthew's account omits the four friends and the hole in the roof. It is not the healing but the forgiveness that Matthew emphasizes in his gospel. For which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, arise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, arise, take up your bed, and go home. And he arose and departed to his house. But notice the reaction of the crowd in Matthew's account. Now when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God who had given such power to men. We hear that, hear it through the Gospel of Mark, and think they glorified God because he had given the power to heal to men. But in Matthew's Gospel, they glorified God because he had given man the power to forgive. Not only does a son have the authority to forgive sins, he has given the power to forgive to mankind. The Son is the icon of the Trinity. The Son has not come to condemn, but to rescue us from the world of judgmental death. The Son forgives and gives us the power to forgive. It is in forgiving that we behave like the icon of the Trinity the icon of God within us. The power to forgive cannot be separated from the Son who gives the power. Without the Lord Jesus and the working of divine power, no one can know the mysteries and the wisdom of God or be rich and be a Christian. That is, we cannot be rich in becoming like Christ. Forgiving drains the poison of the tree of death out of us. It removes the deadness of judgmentalism from us. The loss of judgmentalism 
makes room for life to enter us. Our forgiveness flowing outward from us makes room within us for God's life-giving forgiveness to now flow into us. Life-giving forgiveness. Well, let's come home to paradise. Paradise still has the two trees. When we choose to be rescued and liberated from the world of death, when, like the prodigal, we have come to our senses and returned to the Father's embrace, we have returned to paradise. The paradise, the home to which we have returned, still has two trees, the tree of life, representing the forgiving Father, and the tree of death represented the unforgiving older brother. On the one hand is the tree of life with the forgiving Father, with Zerubbabel showing us how to leave the habits of our captivity that we spoke about in previous episodes. How to leave the habits of our captivity behind and to build a new life based on the tree of life. On the other hand, the tree of death and judgment with the judgmental, unforgiving older brother and the adversaries eagerly offering their deceitful friendship. Such is the paradise we live in. We live in a world surrounded by older brothers former examples of ourselves who are still captive in a visible world of their five senses and they cannot see the tree of life and therefore they live only in a dead world with only the one tree, the tree of death and judgment. We, however, now live in paradise and we see both trees. Having been born blind from birth, but now having been begotten from above, and having received our sight, we now confess with others, this one thing I know, I once was blind, but now I see. At the very least, we now see that we once were blind. Living in paradise, we now see what we've never seen before. We now know what we've never known before. We now can live like we've never lived before and behave like we've never li behaved before. We see people as whole persons, and we forgive instead of judging. Well, it's like coming home to no home we've ever known. In the film Sleepless in Seattle, Sam Baldwin lost his wife to cancer. When asked what was so special about his wife, Sam replies, well, it was a million tiny little things that, when you added them all up, they meant we were supposed to be together. And I knew it. I knew it the very first time I touched her. I took her hand. It was like coming home only to no home I'd ever known. I was just taking her hand to help her out of a car and I knew it was like magic. Before Christ made it possible for us to live in paradise, Adam and Eve are the only humans that ever knowingly lived in paradise. The prodigal son who left home is Adam. 
It is not Adam who returned home. It is Adam's children, 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 Adam's descendants who came to their senses, realized we are living in a pig pen, and decided to return home to the home we have never known. In John's Gospel, Jesus meets a man born blind. The man is us. In Luke's Gospel, Jesus meets a man naked and living in a graveyard. That man is us. We are the prodigal. We are the ones blind. We've been naked so long, we no longer know we're naked. We no longer know we're living in a graveyard, the world of death. And then Jesus comes. He makes it possible to return to paradise. The prodigal comes home. The blind man sees. The naked man living in a graveyard now sits at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. For the first time in our lives, we have come home. After years of hiding our nakedness behind linguistic clothing and empirical fig leaves, after years of whitewashing the tombs and disguising death with celebrations of life, we now find ourselves sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in our right minds, a right mind we have never known before. How does one live clothed and in their right minds? We've never been here before. If anyone is in Christ, he is. She is, we are a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. We are new. We are different. All things have become new because we are new. We are in paradise. Paradise has always been here. And paradise is filled with blind people who don't know they're in paradise. And it dawns on us. We are surrounded in this world by blind people. They don't know who they are or where they are. But clothed and in our right minds, we now choose to eat of the tree of life. We have chosen to live like the icon of the Trinity, the image of God within us, no longer conformed to the blind and naked world. We have been transformed in our thinking we now seek to become a living icon of Christ who is the good, acceptable, and completed icon of the Trinity. Remember back when we looked at Genesis and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in paradise in the cool of the day and Adam and Eve his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the paradise. Most English translations say, and they heard the sound of God walking in the Septuagint and in our Orthodox study Bible. On the other hand, the verse reads, and they heard the voice of the Lord God as God walked through paradise, calling out to Adam and Eve, and they heard the voice of God and hid themselves 
within the tree they had chosen on which to base their existence, the tree of death and judgment. Adam and Eve had already eaten of the tree of death and judgment. Death was now at work in them. Loss of hearing and sight had begun, as had dementia and loss of memory. Their heavenly raiment had vanished, no longer seeing paradise, their shining garments flashing forth like those of the angels, disappeared from their sight even as did the angels. The point is this, Adam and Eve were still in paradise, though paradise was lost to them because death made them captive to their five senses. The point is also this, not only were Adam and Eve, though unknowing, still in paradise, so was their Creator, of whom they had not yet lost awareness of His presence. What remained true then remains true still. Paradise is still here. Mankind is still, without knowing it, still in paradise and unknown to mankind God is still present in his paradise as well. God has never abandoned us. God did not abandon Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve withdrew from God. Instead of the lightning flashes of divinity and illumination, they chose the razzle-dazzle, delighted delight to the flashy eyes of the world. Though physically still present, they were now outside paradise. They were outside the blessed way of life. To the extent they withdrew from life, they likewise drew near to death. For God is life, and the privation of life is death. Adam and Eve prepared death for themselves when they withdrew from God. But God never left, and Adam and Eve withdrew from God and hid themselves, wrapped their lives around the tree of death and judgment, and the tree of death and judgment wrapped itself around them and began to squeeze the life out of them. The tree of death and judgment was still in paradise. The tree of life was also still in paradise. God, the source and creator, was still in paradise. The far country in which the prodigal squandered his inheritance was miles away from blessedness, but it was only down the road and across town in location. The father never left. His heart never changed. He knew where his son was and what he was doing. He loved both his sons, the one who stayed and the one who left, because the sun shines on both good and bad, and the sun shines on the righteous and on the unrighteous. God did not destroy the tree in which Adam and Eve chose to live, nor did he destroy Adam and Eve. Instead, the Creator set in motion the means by which he could rescue mankind from the death it we had chosen. In the fullness of time, the invisible God of paradise came to be born of a woman, born in this world of law, a world of death, to redeem those living in the world of law, 
that we might receive adoption as sons and daughters, children. He who was invisible became visible in paradise by becoming a visible human. He who created us to become his livable, visible icons, he himself became that living, visible human icon. By so doing, this second Adam, he reminded us of who we are. He reminded us what life looks like and what life in paradise looks like. He became one of us so that we could become like him. We are living in paradise with its two trees. You see, the fullness, therefore, of the law consists in forgiveness. We literally fill up and completely fill the law with forgiveness because forgiveness is given to the one forgiving. It is not in the keeping of the law, but in forgiving those who break the law that the law is fulfilled. Do not be shocked at this. When asked what is the greatest commandment that is, what is the single most important law that absolutely must be kept and followed, Jesus replied, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. In case we missed it, in case we don't understand, there is no rule book in paradise. Jesus gives us only one rule to live by. A new commandment I give you, love one another the same way I loved you. I have become one of you so that you can become like me. The father waiting with open arms for his son to come home is like the Trinity. There is no condemnation, there are no lectures, no reprimands, no, I told you so. Instead, there are open arms and forgiveness. Now clothed with the garments of salvation, we approach the banquet feast of the fatted calf, the Lamb of God, the tree of life, now in the middle of our lives, forgiven. We are forgiven. What does it feel like? It feels like this. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bride groom decks himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. That verse is from Isaiah 61.10, and it becomes and is part of the prayer said by all Orthodox clergy, deacons, priests, and bishops when they vest for a service. Having been forgiven, we now forgive. This is our new life in paradise. We fill up the law, we fill in the blanks by forgiving others instead of judging them. We receive forgiveness for ourselves for having judged others in the first place. Therefore, those who spiritually fulfill the law and in proportion 
as they participated in grace, loved with a spiritual love not only those who did good to them, but also loved those that reproached them and persecuted them, looking forward to good things. Of good things, I say, not because they forgave the wrongs done to them, but because they also did good to the persons who did wrong to them. I do good to the person that did wrong to me because they have given me an opportunity in forgiving them to receive forgiveness for myself. This is life in paradise. First, forgiving those who break our rules and forgiving those who are mean to us. And secondly, doing good to those who break our rules and are mean to us. Oh my, step one, instead of judging, we forgive. Step two, not only do we forgive, we now do good to the persons we originally judged in the first place. Surely this is madness. You're right. It is the madness of God. I say to you, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who spiritually use you. To him who strikes you on the one cheek, offer the other. And from him who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic. Give to everyone that asks you, and from him who takes away your goods, do not ask for them back. And just as you want men to do to you, do to them also. For if you love those that only love you, what credit is that? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that? Everyone else does the same. And if you lend to those that you hope will repay you, what credit? For everyone lends to sinners to receive something back. But love your enemies. Do good and lend, hoping for nothing in return. And for your reward will be great, and you will be the sons of the Most High. For he is kind to the unthankful, he is kind to the evil. Therefore, be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we endure. Being defamed, we entreat. Blessed are you when they will revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you for my sake. By forgiven, by forgiving, we are forgiven. Being reviled, we bless, and we are blessed in return. Blessed and forgiven, this is life in paradise. This is a different culture a different theology, a, another type of revolution, a compulsion of a different sort. It is the overthrow of the tree of judgment in the world of death. The blessing by living like this, forgiving and blessing, the blessing is we become Christ by grace. We rejoice because we comprehend that our existence, our life, and our words can feed and strengthen others. Our presence and our words are now food to be eaten and drink to be consumed to satisfy and quench the thirst of another who is unknown and a stranger who suffers and grieves to quench the thirst of their true, precious, 
and actual self, their entire being. This is the goal of life, to reach maturity in order to give and offer oneself to others. So finally, let us know there is only one whole, W-H-O-L-E. This is the mystery of God's will, that in the fullness of time, that he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. There is only one whole, one paradise, including the divine and the human, the living and the departed, heaven and earth, the tree of life and the tree of death, forgiveness and judgment, persecution and blessing, that Christ may be all in all. There is only one whole, W-H-O-L-E, one paradise. The invisible trinity created mankind to become the visible expression of itself, of trinity. Mankind refused and invisible to mankind, the invisible creator became human to give forgiveness to his creation, to rescue them from the world of death, that those so rescued might become living icons of himself, the creator, with the result that paradise now would be filled with multiple icons, multiple Christ, forgiving and blessing all those living in this world of death. When one is enlisted with him who was crucified in order to save his friends, then everyone becomes his friend, even those who crucify him. That person is great who is the least, who is sensitive, humble, who loves, who has received the grace of God and is incapable of doing evil to others, incapable of wounding them, and capable of suffering, of enduring, of himself dying out of love so that others who are not separated even from himself, may live and make progress and be glad. You see, we win when others win. We do not want to win by trampling on everyone else. We want to live the joy that raises everyone up. There is one whole, W-H, O-L-E, one faith, one Lord, one baptism, one humanity, one all-holy trinity who is above all and through all and in us all. We do not live in the same world the world lives in. They live in our world. We do not live in theirs. We do not have any adversaries. We do not wage battle against anyone. All those around us are in fact hungry and thirsty. Those who strike us are our friends and those who hate us are our brothers and sisters. Those who hurt us or offend us are our benefactors since we receive from them the occasion of our own forgiveness. We cannot save ourselves. There is no other way to be saved except through our neighbor, especially the neighbor who offends us. The sins, the faults, the mistakes 
of those around us. Give us the opportunity of forgiveness for ourselves. It is by being grateful for the one who offends us, for giving us now the opportunity to forgive them that we gain entrance into the deepest mysteries of forgiveness, that we now want to, in thankfulness for them, do good to them. In the joy of being forgiven ourselves, in our gratitude to the one who offended us, and the forgiveness we have received in having forgiven them, we not only forgive them, but we now do good to the person who offends us. There we have it. There is one paradise, and it has two trees. Well, I want to thank you for making this 16-week journey with us, 16 episodes. I want to thank Richard Yeager for videotaping this, for Charlie Ward for making it available uh, on all the internet systems where you can find it. And I want to thank you for sending us an email, contacting us. Normally I've read out the names of those. I haven't done it since we haven't taped in so many months and the list would have been so long of those uh, from the United States and other countries who continue to call. Some on the phone, by the way. Uh, some on Facebook, others by email, contacting us. We are grateful for you. We are grateful for those who participate here locally and for taking a chance to set out on an unknown journey. We took, started back in September a year ago to see where it led us. And it led us to this. There is one whole, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one paradise, and it has two trees. God bless you.